this resistance and resurrection started in those cells. In those cells, 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 cells. Since 1949, terrible things have happened regularly in the population of China at the hands of its own government. For the purpose of taking power, the peasants had been used. destroy the temples, destroy the churches, control, spiritually control people. The Chinese Communist Party uh, recruited all the well-educated people. If uh, you don't want to, they will try to force you to join the party. So I was educated to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. For a generation, there's been no controversy. There is now going to be a controversy, and it's not just me saying, it is members of the U.S. Congress, it's other members of the European Parliament, it is national parliamentarians right around the world who are saying, hang on, look at Beijing and let's see what the regime is doing before we give our consent to the games going ahead. They have never stopped trying to control the people's spirit. So the question really is, why do we need human rights torch relay for the Olympics in China? Why? We see their baleful influence in Africa, for example in Sudan, where Chinese oil is more important than doing something about the genocide in Darfur, in Zimbabwe, where they're propping up the dictator Mugabe. We see their baleful influence all over the world. In 1964, the International Olympic Committee, urged by people like Lord Avebury and others, boycotted South Africa's participation in the Olympic Games. The Olympics will not be cancelled, but they can be moved. Athens in 2004, Sydney in 2000, and Barcelona in 1992 all have the infrastructure and the stadia to take the 2008 Olympic Games. It is pointless to threaten China with anything else. We cannot go in there and invade them, for God's sakes. And we believe, we believe that... I'm here because I want to support the Olympic ideal, and that is justice for all people. Why are we not allowed to? Because Falun Gong is opposed by the Russian government, is that why? It is why. Falun Gong is an entirely peaceful movement. I believe that we still have a mega vote. They should be changed. I'm willing to. To my understanding that the Chinese Communist government has been very successful in overseas propaganda to convince the world it's turning to democracy, it's not a brutal dictatorship anymore. That's a lie, totally a lie.
1999, the government of President Jiang Zemin declared a brutal war on Falun Gong practitioners. No doubt because the president, uh, uh, Yang, was afraid of its growing popularity as an exercise spiritual movement which is deeply rooted in the Qigong, Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism traditions of the Chinese people. I started to practice Falun Gong in 1997. At that time, uh, Falun Gong was actually the most popular um, Qigong in China. These are uh, very typical Chinese elements of religions. Now has been uh, become very attractive to non-Chinese people across race and culture. And uh, I think this is a very important uh, breakthrough. I practiced for about eight years now, and it seemed like all my uh, old habits, my bad habits, just kind of faded away uh, without me trying. As a practitioner of Falun Gong, we practice and assimilate to the qualities of Zhen, Shan, Zhen. And Zhen, for lack of a better word, is truthfulness, being honest, not cheating anybody, and trying to be a true man or a true woman. And Shan is about benevolence, kindness, compassion. And Zhen is kind of about forbearance, tolerance, endurance. So I try to assimilate to these qualities in my life at all times. And it's had a big, a big effect on me, as it has a big effect on tens of millions of other practitioners all across the world. One of the things people should know about China is that articles like that are not like in the West. If an article appears in a Chinese newspaper, it's a state-run newspaper, it's a signal. It's a signal that an idea is being tried out very seriously by somebody at the highest levels of the Chinese government. You have two choices. You can ignore it, or you can say something about it. If you ignore it, maybe that becomes law. If you say something about it, you take a big risk. It's that simple. Okay, uh, so all this business about Falun Gong being sort of, you know, very political on this is, is really kind of irrelevant. There were no signs, nobody said anything, there were no slogans shouted. But uh, Jiang Zemin heard about this, of course, inside, and he uh, got in his tinted window car, and he drove around. There was no danger. There's nothing going on of that nature. He's, he's perfectly confident of doing that. And he saw these thousands of people, including members of the party, retired military, retired diplomats, a very wide representation of occupations in Falun Gong and ages and so on. And he went in and he, he panicked and he wrote a letter that night which basically said, Marxism will defeat Falun Gong. He recognized that because of uh, 10,000 people, it's a surprise to the, to the Communist Party. They, they are worried about uh, 
uh, the party may be threatened by such a big group. I think there is something about the Falun Gong which is emblematic of all the things the Chinese government gets very nervous about. First of all, it's a non-violent form of opposition. Second of all, it involves an amazing number of people silently expressing their disapproval of how the Chinese government had behaved. I was in Beijing. I called maybe the top reporter, the bureau chief of the South China Morning Post and said, you know, what, what the hell's happening out there, Jasper? What's, what's, what's going on? And he said, Ethan, we really don't know. We, we, we've been caught with our pants down. We don't know anything about this group. And from that minute on, I mean, in a funny way, I was a little hooked. <laughs> July 20th, Night of the Long Knives, where the main organizers uh, are rounded up in Beijing. Uh, July 21st, uh, the secondary ones are rounded up. July 22nd, the ban is made known to everybody in China and the world. On that day, when I went to our normal practice site in a park, nobody was there. There was no fungal practice in Park Week at all. I was told by my, my parents to go back home to um, and so sit in front of the TV for the so-called uh, important information or message from the TV from the TV by the government. So that means, as far as I understand, that means everyone in the, in the, work, uh, in the workplace was told the same. And a couple of uh, colleagues ran into my office. I was the only, only white guy there. Ethan, they're talking about Falun Gong on television. And since it was a for basically a forbidden topic at the time, that was sh shocking. And they didn't mean television, they meant China Central Television. They meant the real network, the big controlled network. And I came out and there was this expose, sort of uh, inside edition style uh, report. We heard this sound, uh, scratchy shouting on the street outside. And we looked out the window, and there were sound trucks that looked as if they'd been built in the 50s during the Cultural Revolution, you know, painted red, and huge, uh, you know, huge, uh, his master's voice type uh, uh, devices on them. And they were driving around kind of aimlessly and sort of screeching, do not practice Falun Gong. Falun Gong is illegal. Uh, uh, one of the women who was there, uh, one of the producers uh, from Hong Kong, started crying. And she said, it's, this is like uh, the Cultural Revolution all over again. Uh, it was a very disturbing, very strange moment. There's something about the word cult. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan is a cult. The National Front is a cult. I mean, it always has a kind of black background to it. So by using that term in China, the Chinese government was able to get people to say to themselves, well, if it's a cult, that's bad. I was just starting my job as a university lecturer in Beijing. After the persecution started, I was dismissed by the university authority. 
They told me they have to follow the government's policies dealing of how to deal with Falun Gong people if they, you know, just stick to their uh, their practice, their beliefs. People find no right, no place to ventilate their grievances uh, and no avenue for them to de defend their lawful rights such that they have to stand up and protest to defend their own rights. Unleash a banner or just stand there and do the exercises, you know, uh, but they're just being arrested, taken out one by one. 2001. Well, I went to Beijing again. About this time, is I was to to go to Tiananmen Square to appeal for Falun Gong because, from my own experience, I know Falun Gong is very good, and all the government, all the TV stations, what they said, is totally wrong. And untrue. They are deliberately misleading people. I don't think it's right. I think that people should have the right to, to know the truth. So that's why I, I, I went to Beijing to appeal for Falun Gong because that's my right. There's no coordination whatsoever. One group will stand up, boom, the vans will move in, take them out, and then another group on another part of the square will stand up. The vans move over there. What we call the Battle of Tiananmen begins in December 1999 and really reaches its first peak in January 2000. This is where thousands of practitioners start showing up, thousands upon thousands, streaming in from the countryside. I was arrested on the Tiananmen Square straight away. And as, as you can imagine, I was beaten on the spot and uh, taken away by uh, the police, a plainclothes police. The lambs going on to the slaughter. I mean, half of them are going to Tiananmen Square, the other half are going to the appeals office, which is, you might as well be just putting your hands in cuffs yourself because they're going to take anything you write on your appeals form, rip it up, and, uh, and then take you back to your province and uh, put you in jail. During the about 10 hours or even more interrogation process, they, they used electronic button to shock my head, fingers, anywhere, you know, sensitive to, to just to make you felt painful. At one stage, they even used the hot chili powder to put in my nose and mouth. I don't know, I think the police, they just went quite crazy. The four or five of them just came up and used what they have, like, like their belt and batons to beat me up. That's what they, uh, uh, they were that's what they, they, were, they were doing as a policeman to, to, to treat Falun Gong practitioners. Uh, this is something that I think uh, journalists have had a hard time understanding. The fact that they weren't organized by some sort of central, uh, uh, central command also made it extremely hard to break. It's around the years 2002 that it sets in, in the West, uh, within uh, practitioner circles, that the West is not going to save them, that nobody is going to do anything.
qui était assis. Oh et euh, ouais. euh, ah. Ah. en fait, on s'est dit à trois, nous avons déroulé la banderole. Ah. Et sur notre banderole, il y avait marqué Falun Dafa et les trois principes de la méthode qui sont l'authenticité, la compassion et la patience. I, uh, you know, studied medicine in China and came to the United States of America in the year of 1991. Falun Gong is such a powerful meditation system. It worked so well for me. You know, I, I was very pleased. Two years after I started practice, you know, the Chinese Communist regime started uh, the persecution of Falun Gong because there, there were so many people, you know, to uh, practice this. At the end of 1998, it was estimated that, that there were 100 million people in, in China alone practicing Falun Gong. So the communist regime in the, got paranoid. It was certainly known that there was some significant number of Chinese bureaucrats or officials and maybe even army officers who were either in Falun Gong or practiced uh, its, um, uh, its methodology as, as they had been involved with Qigong, uh, with that kind of uh, traditional exercise before. Ban the party members first, and then ban the civil servants, and then later totally ban the 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 Falun Gong. I went back to China in 2000, trying to you know get contact with the uh, practitioners inside China, and I kept in touch with them for a long time. And during that process, I understood you know how they were treated inside China. Almost all of them had been, you know, sent to the uh, mental hospitals because, you know, they label these, uh, you know, practitioners as like mentally sick or something. It's so important in human rights work that we get our facts straight and sufficient volume of facts and the preponderance of facts to persuade people so that when you come out with an allegation, people will believe you. I thought I was researching a type of human rights abuse that was in historical decline. This was something that was done a lot in the 60s, 70s and 80s, you know, sending sane dissidents to police-run mental hospitals and throwing away the key. Then, in the late 90s, with the crackdown on Falun Gong, it starts up again. Large numbers of Falun Gong sent to mental hospitals, falsely accused of being mentally ill, and forced to take uh, electric shock treatment, psychotropic drugs, all the rest of it. Um, now that is still going on, and it's disgraceful. It's very convenient, uh, there is no comeback, uh, you have no right of judicial appeal, uh, the police can put you in a, in, a, in a high security institute for the criminally insane forever. You have no rights until the doctors there decide that you're quote unquote sane enough to be released. So it's very frightening, it's an extremely effective way to silence critics. I've interviewed about 120 people, extended sit-down interviews, Bangkok to Australia, weeks and weeks in Taiwan to Canada, all over the United States, and Europe as well, uh, to try to talk to the refugees. It would be great to go into China, and it would be great if I had some sort of invisibility cloak, and I could do that, and, and uh, but I don't, and you know, I am a white guy. 
and I will be followed in China. I'm not really welcome in China after writing Losing the New China. I would simply get Falun Gong practitioners in trouble. Uh, and they don't need that extra trouble at this point. Many of them were sent to the labor camps. The Communist Party labeled that as re-education, you know, because they want to reform people. They want to reform people's mind and the behavior according to their own doctrine. And I was from China, and you know, my friends, my family are all there, you know. And you know, as a Chinese, I had you know this responsibility to help people. I was taking away to a cell for about five or seven days without informing my my family at all. And then I started to refuse um, their food and water as a, the only way I can you know, to protect my, my right. Because I don't think I have done anything wrong, even according to the, to the, uh, to the laws. After about four days without their food and water, they tied me up to a chair. They used the pipe and just to you know, push very hard to your mouth or you know, to pump in some stuff. The whole process was very hard. Hundreds of Falun Gong practitioners actually died during a uh, force feeding process. Zhao Ming started doing the exercises. There's some motion from the policeman's office, and a policeman comes charging in, he hits Zhao Ming squarely in the cerebral cortex. He goes crashing to the ground, and Ma looks at him and thinks, he's dead. But he's not. She looks away, she looks back, he's up. He assumes the second position, that's where he was. Uh, and just as he assumes the second position, the policeman starts beating him up. But this time it's different. He goes after him. Uh, he doesn't want him to fall. He, you know, kicks him in the balls. He takes him in the chin, you know, one after the other, after the other. Eventually, he crumples, he goes down. She looks away, she looks back, he's up again. Second position. Guy goes after him. This time, she looks away. We don't really know what happened, and he doesn't remember very well at this point. But it went on for a couple of minutes, okay? Bone crunching sounds. Uh, she looks up, back in the second position. Uh, cop gives up. Now, is that a made up story? I don't think so. One of the crucial questions about Falun Gong is that is Falun Gong a cult or evil cult? Personally, I'm not a believer in Falun Gong, in its philosophy, or in its Qigong. But I am deeply committed, strongly committed to the view that Falun Gong is a peaceful organization. I have no legal or other moral reason to support the accusation that Falun Gong is an evil cult. I would rather say Falun Gong is a spiritual movement. It has no plan or ambition, so far as I know, to threaten the peace, order and stability of a society, including the society I'm living in. I see no reason at all why we should interfere with the freedom of the Falun Gong members in continuing to do what they have been doing make people uh, believe that Falun Gong is a cult and uh, so that uh, it should be banned and uh, in China should be eliminated. Now, of course, one has the freedom to pass judgment on other people. But I think it is a very, very serious matter uh, for people to do something to restrain other people's freedom. Freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of association or freedom of demonstration because you take the view that 
this organization is evil. The 1st of March, without any legal trial or process, I was arrested and sentenced for two years in the labor camp. They forced me to sit on the very hard stool, which is 30 centimeters square, and the surface is very uneven. I have to sit there over 20 hours a day and without permission, I'm not allowed to move a little bit. My knees have to be close, my feet have to be close, and my back have to be very straight, and put my double hand on my knees and uh, not allowed to close my eyes and sitting like this for over 20 hours a day. And just a week later, my bottom is broken and some other practitioners, their bottom already all rot, become rot. They couldn't see it anymore. And uh, because I suffered both mentally and uh, physically, so all my hair turned white. Now you look my hair, my hair is dyed color. It all has gone white. And my memory is very bad now, very weak. And even my eyesight is very, very bad. The Chinese government, like any other authoritarian government, they want to control people's minds. I'm always surprised when people um, are surprised that the Falun Gong has been treated so harshly in China. Obviously, I'm not condoning anything that has been done in China, but I'm just saying that it makes perfect sense from an international politics and from even a political science perspective, if you are a leader of an authoritarian regime, you don't really want to have growing numbers of people going into the millions who believe in the truth, compassion and forbearance. All three are a problem for any kind of authoritarian government, but I think the truth one is the one that certainly doesn't sound very good for the authorities. There have been Qigong movements out there for years, but Falun Gong separated itself out very quickly because Master Li was promoting a morality-based idea. Uh, and saying even the universe was controlled by these moral laws, not controlled by the Communist Party. The explosive growth of the uh, Falun Gong through Chinese society, through all layers of it, okay, going from peasants in the heartland, right, all the way up to university professors and, in fact, members of the Chinese Communist Party, and this starts very early. This was like a fire spreading through the rocket. I mean, it starts down here at the bottom, shoots up all through the stages, the smoke is in the capsule, uh, maybe a little more than the smoke. So by the time they, they decide to put an end to this fire. Uh, so from that perspective, this was extremely dangerous. The idea of that anybody could have two masters, the fact that he was called Master Li. The fact that Master Li uh, had come almost from nowhere, the fact that, uh, that he didn't give orders, I think in some ways was one of the most striking things. And that yet it spread so quickly. This is what worried them. They have controlled people's mind, you know, by not allowing, allowing any other information, and they control all medium, you know. They have continues to have political movements, have brainwash, you know, campaigns. Everybody 
according to them, you know, should be reformed, you know, by the party line. So in this case, you know, especially in the persecution of Falun Gong, they have told so many lies about Falun Gong, you know. People had no way to know the truth. If they always listen to the, the lies, they will eventually believe, you know, part or a whole what they say because there's no other reference to compare, you know, what is really truth. I think it's important that people are aware of the facts and they are told the facts and uh, then they will just come up with their own opinion. Um, but there is, if you, if you only give your side, you will play in the hands of the Chinese propaganda because to some extent then they will say, well, you know, see this, they don't even consider our point of view, we had good reasons. And as I said, they, from their perspective, I think they have very good reasons to be afraid of Falun Gong, to be afraid of Tibet. You'll see a lot of Chinese Communist Party propaganda uh, about the crazy primitive beliefs, aliens or UFOs or, or anti-evolutionary theories and so on. They have a very tight uh, scrutiny on the media about everything they write on Falun Gong and its members and all their activities. In fact, the elimination was supposed to be over by the end of the year 1999. Now we're coming into 2001. Basically, they will be banned, and they are not allowed to appear uh, on the screen or on any media, unless there's some negative news about Falun Gong. I think it is a policy of the propaganda department. The problem also seems to be that the public has gone along with the persecution of Falun Gong, but not as enthusiastically as all that. They see this as basically some sort of retread of the Cultural Revolution. Why did they leave these people alone? You know, at the time? That changes with the self-immolation. The self-immolation is the single defining point, the single worst day in Falun Gong history. Well, I think it has to do with, uh, with the, the, the intense media campaign that has been levied against the Falun Gong community since about April of 99. They put things on television, I gather, and I've seen a couple of them, where they suggest that uh, Falun Gong practitioners tried to immolate, self-immolate themselves in Tiananmen Square. And yet, if you have a follow this thing closely, you can see it's pretty obvious that it's kind of a set-up thing and that you see a hand come into the screen very quickly and the, the people arrive within 30 seconds. Did they not know? I mean, it, it looks so, it looks pretty foamy. He was in the far side of the square. Now he started shooting, but he had a standard way of shooting, which is he'd shoot five seconds, 10 seconds of tape, pull tape, hide it, another one in, pull tape, hide it, another one in, and advance, okay? He didn't get very far, okay? He made it something 50 yards down the square, police jumped on him, took his uh, tape, but they didn't take all of it. It shows burning figures from a long ways away, nothing like what the Chinese government is showing you as the footage there. If you go to a Hollywood stuntman and ask them, what's, what's one of the most exciting tricks you can do? They'd say, set myself on fire. And you'd say, well, that sounds really dangerous. They'd say, no, no, it's really not. It's no problem. Just do it under the right conditions, you'll get through it.
the story is not accurate the way it has been told by the Chinese government. Uh, we know that Falun Gong didn't encourage this, that we can say with some confidence. Uh, there's not suicides all over the place. But we do know one thing. We know this had the most dramatic impact. The sight of a child burning on that square, even if it was a stunt, even if it was meant to be just a stunt, even if these were convicted criminals who were under some intense pressure and were told that they could do the stunt and they'd thereby release any bonds they had to the state. That sight uh, changed the Chinese public's view of Falun Gong. It became extremely negative, and that's when in the prison system you start to see the deaths really increase. Convince the world that the Communist Party policy of uh, persecuting Falun Gong is uh, legitimate, it's reasonable, it's uh, from the will of the people, it's not uh, for any political purpose. remaining inhibitions about uh, torturing practitioners to get them to transform, uh, drop away at this point. Uh, and it becomes clear that the 610 office allows prison systems now to have a death quota, to have a certain amount of practitioners they're allowed to just kill off at any given time. In this case, you know, it's extremely important to break through this in you know, a medium blockade by the Communist Party. So inside China, a lot of Falun Gong practitioners, they risk their lives to you know, hand out the flyers and to hand out the uh, DVDs and uh, tell the people by the words of mouth. And starting from March 2002, some practitioners successfully you know, use a TV network to broadcast the truth you know, uh, of persecution of Falun Gong. And I, I saw that is, you know, that was a extremely effective because you can reach thousands of people at a time. They all have personalities. There's the, there's the jock, there's the smart gun, there's the tomboy girl, one who shows them how to climb up a telephone pole. But they actually pull off this feat of changing something like six channels all simultaneously to a Falun Gong truth clarification video exposing the lie of uh, the self-immolation on Tiananmen Square for 45 minutes. That's pretty good. <laughs> We have tried talking to the state, now we have to talk to the people. We have to take our case directly to them. This is very, very effective political work. That's followed by one of the worst roundups uh, in modern Chinese history. One of them is released. We find this unbelievable in the West because we think of the press and so on, but they don't have that in China, okay? So to release a dying practitioner was to send a warning message uh, to the home province. Don't try this at home. There's some fantastic footage out there of him walking around uh, after his spine has basically been broken. Some people ask, uh, are Falun Gong practitioners getting political? Here's my thought on this. Uh, and this is a delicate situation here. Could you imagine if it was your personal lover, your personal wife, your parents, your children that were actually in slave labor camps or were killed? What would you do? Would you just stand there? I don't think so. I think if it was a personal thing, you would probably do something to help out. In October 2002, you know, I went back to, uh, to, 
to China, uh, to Jiangsu province, because you know that is also the uh, hometown of the uh, head, uh, the Communist Party head. So I think that's extremely important for people over there to know the truth. And I spent like uh, three weeks to prepare the uh, you know tapping devices. October twenty second, I was carrying the five sets of devices in in two bags and walking in the city of Yangtze at night. And you know, I was planning to you know, tap into the TV network at that night. But when I was walking in the, in the street, you know, I was stopped by the patrol police. To be physically beaten by the police, yes, it's painful, but compared with the forced brainwashing. The latter is, is more, is more, more difficult to, to endure as a human being. After two weeks, my mind would, you know, would go very slowly because there was no information at all, you know. No TV, no talking, no nothing. Just sit there. So that that's kind of mental torture, you know. It's, it makes you like, you know, it's like you become nuts. Yeah, your 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 mind is like getting slow and slow. I was trying to recall some, you know, some things I learned before to make my mind active. Otherwise, it would be like, you know, like mind dead. You know. <laughs> so that is, you know, extremely um, uh, suffocating. Actually, they spend a lot of money and manpower. Almost every Falun Gong practitioner in the brainwashing center, they have at least one people to follow them 24 hours. Even when I was taking a shower, they would, they would stand beside me. From the early morning till very late at night, you have to watch and to listen to and to read all the propaganda. You know it's propaganda, you know it's untrue, but you have to watch it. If you don't, they will use some, you know, methods like it, uh, use electronic baton or other torture methods to force you to do what they they ask you to do. They just kept torturing me because I refused. They they use all different ways to torture me, uh, to like force me to sit straight all day long from seven o'clock in the morning to 9 o'clock in the evening. The longest was 48 days consecutively. Every day I was forced to sit on the little stool until I, you know, I had a heart problem. I should probably mention here, especially after what we just heard a few moments ago, that uh, other Falun Gong practitioners who have managed to get out of China, such as, such as Mr. Xu, have told David Maitis and myself that they, without any charges or court proceedings, worked as unpaid workers in re-education camps for up to 16 hours daily in unhygienic and brutal conditions. Making things, if you can imagine, like chopsticks, shoes, garments, and various promotional items for foreign companies. all for export markets. I ask rhetorically, where is the, the World Trade Organization? Sixty people, you know, crammed in the small room. Like, you know, you sit in one, uh, uh, next to each other and do those, like, uh, many work in a, in a small table. In the, in the summer, the temperature was 42 degrees you know, centigrade. There was no air condition. And even, even if you did not do anything, you sit there, you, you, just, you, know, you just wait. You know? So, so I, you still was forced to, you know, to do all those labor works.
And they also had a kind of, they call this condemnation session. This is like a political uh, term inside China, inside the communist regime system. The condemnation uh, session is a sort of uh, rally, you know, the so-called criminal or those who should be reformed would stand in the center. And all, all the other people would surround him or her to yell at him, to call her name or his name, to say, you are such a bad person, you should be doomed, things like that. All, you know, all those bad words, very dirty words, I was not able to repeat those. So they had condemnation sessions all the time. One group you know, did this to you, like, you know, just you know, trying to you know, shame yourself, you know, sort of shame on you, things, things like that. And after this group left, another group would come. So they try to exhaust, you know, those people. They do one thing after another. They give you no break at all. You know, after slave labor, then they will do this study session, brainwashing session, condemnation session. My treatment, even though it was, you know, extremely suffocating, but it's still better than those practitioners inside China because, because we know that many, many people have been tortured to death, literally just tortured to death, beaten to death. Right now, it's like more than 3,000. As w what we know, you know, their names, their address, and their stories. But we, what we don't know is far beyond this number. And also, we know that uh, they took the uh, Falun Gong practitioners' organs out for profit when they were alive. Because I was an American citizen, so you know, I was not like treated like that. You know, being tortured to death. You know, I I was able to get out of the prison. You know, with my body intact. Tiananmen had had a trickle-down effect to society. What it had done was opened up the minds of the Chinese people. The 80s had opened up the minds of the Chinese people. In many ways, the 80s was a much freer period in China than the 90s or the present time is. You could, you could talk about anything for a little while. Uh, you, you, you could think anything. A lot of spiritual practices which had kind of lay unused in the corner somewhere for a long time, were suddenly being pulled out, dusted off, looked at anew. Uh, and that's partly what the Qigong thing is about, the Qigong craze. But uh, Falun Gong was, was actually pulling on a much stronger tradition, something even deeper. No churches, no organization, no money. It's a very significant thing. It's, a, it almost, uh, it's almost never commented on in the West. These things are very threatening, again, to the Chinese Communist Party from their perspective. Um, but from a Chinese standpoint, they're incredibly familiar. Even people who didn't have any religious background, who just maybe had one granny or one grandpa who used to talk about something, or even just some folk belief. Everybody has an, uh, almost a genetic memory, sleeping of a different time in China uh, when things were in harmony. Li Hongzhi did not actively promote himself so much as, as I understand it, showed up at a Qigong conference took the crowd by storm, uh, and that was it. Falun Gong was off and running. It was about that simple. From a practitioner's perspective, he's given them a treasure, a, spe a unique treasure, something they couldn't imagine. Uh, he's a very important guy to them, to say the least. A friend of mine, who's a Falun Gong practitioner now, 
was a Chinese diplomat. In the mid-90s, mid-late 90s, he went back to Beijing and he went to the foreign ministry and he noticed that in the foreign ministry, people were doing, a, doing a meditation. And he said to his colleague, he said, why do you pay these people to do nothing? And uh, his colleague said, well, we believe, basically, we believe in Falun Gong. We encourage the diplomats to do Falun Gong because it's good, as you just heard, for their health. And uh, this is the mid-90s. Uh, I'm told that it, the Consul General in New York, diplomatic staff, gave a course on Falun Gong for New Yorkers to show them about Chinese culture. We also know that the Chinese government was actively promoting those ideas as well. During that period, he was invited to Paris to show the to lecture in the uh, Chinese embassy in Paris. Uh, we've talked to people who were there at the time. He was very well received. Uh, you know, uh, the Qigong organizations of China promoted Falun Gong. You can go back and look at the news coverage of Falun Gong at the time, uh, which was very positive. He does represent, or he resembles, what we would think of as a spiritual leader a little more cleanly uh, than any we've seen in quite some time. Maybe they didn't want the competition. This kind of thing happens in China. It is not a complete signal that the government had chosen to suppress the whole spiritual practice. But as the numbers grew, which you, you just heard, uh, I think uh, Jiang Zemin panicked and he thought he may have known that Falun Gong is not political and it isn't. It's, they have want nothing to do with politics. And as I told you that when they were put, sitting around the, the party headquarters they didn't say anything. They didn't say down with communism or anything. But he figured that this is movements growing so quickly that pretty soon if they became political they could, they could topple this wonderful Communist Party of China. The important thing to understand about what happened on Zhang Nanhai that day is that this campaign against Falun Gong had already started years before. I recently did an interview with a finance minister uh, who's now in exile uh, in Sydney. And he revealed that he was told to uh, start turning down anybody who was Falun Gong for a business license. A couple of months later, he was told, you know, actually get rid of the people who have business licenses, remove their, er eradicate their business licenses, revoke their business licenses, anyone who's Falun Gong. Now that is a campaign, and he was very clear about it, what Jiang Zemin had chosen and what the party had chosen. And it was already in place in 1998. Eliminate Falun Gong. 1999 is just a playing out, month after month, of that. So first you have Chen Jin, then you have uh, Zhang Nanhai. Perhaps I can add to this. Uh... In the nine commentaries on the nature of the Communist Party published by the Epoch Times, it says clearly that communism is not a Chinese idea. It's a Western import into the Chinese culture from Russia. Alien idea to Chinese traditional tolerance, truthfulness, and these qualities embedded in Chinese culture. And that's why it doesn't sit well with the Chinese people. And throughout its reign of 56 years, it has periodically undertaken 
purchase in which he was wiping out vast numbers of the population, whether they were the landowners or the intelligentsia or the artists. And there were about six or seven of these waves in which 80 million people of Chinese people lost their lives. And uh, the last wave is now the, now the Falun Gong, apparently. So this is something that the communists do to stay in power in that country. In Shenzhen, practitioners are told to go to Zhang Ranai, told to go to the National Appeals Office in Beijing to make their case. That's what they're told by the police. When they showed up at Zhangnanhai, it was treated as high insurrection, a day of infamy. A lot of journalists have bought into this, and it's a funny one, is that the uh, Chinese government was taken completely by surprise. Two practitioners, I trust them, uh, uh, completely. They were walking by the Forbidden City and they stumbled into a, an armed unit, fully armed, uh, bayonet ready, uh, in uh, military vans. Months progress. By June, the government is on one hand saying there are no interference with Falun Gong. But in fact, what the government is doing in June, on the 10th of June, is creating the 610 office, the machine that will lead to imprisonment and death of, of thousands. How much money was spent on it, and far worse, how much cruelty was used by it, is a, is a subject that I hope somebody will write a book about. There's a representative latched on to every level of the CCP hierarchy um, that is pervasive and goes all the way down to neighborhoods and townships and um, streets with their little neighborhood watch groups. Uh, and they, there are all orders for everyone, each one of those down to that level to, to create their own 610 office. Um, there was one bit of research I came across where um, it was an archived website of a university in Qingdao. And it was from their Public Security Bureau's website. I guess they have their own Public Security Bureau. And in it, they were talking about how they were creating a 610 office in the university. This policeman told me that if he didn't have 100%, uh, they call it uh, 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 re-education or some stupid term like that. Well, that's, uh, that's actually a very good question. Transformation in its simplest form meant sign a piece of paper saying you renounce Falun Gong and that you won't practice it. Actually, no, but it didn't just mean that. Actually, it meant you need to make sort of a more personal statement of what Falun Gong means to you, or what it meant to you, how it led you astray, and why you're rejecting it. Actually, it doesn't just mean that. It means that you, after you've made such a statement, you really ought to put that on camera, maybe on national TV. Actually, it doesn't just mean that. It means you're probably going to go to some conferences and things like that and show up uh, and say that same statement there. And then actually, it doesn't just mean that. It means you're going to spend a lot more time in prison trying to help transform other practitioners. Uh, and when you've transformed enough practitioners, then perhaps your transformation uh, is, will be accepted, and you will be released. That became the big problem for a lot of practitioners. It was one thing when people would say, OK, just sign the stupid statement, get out, you can go practice again. That was genuinely tempting. It was these other aspects to transformation which became so vexing. Uh, for a practitioner to have to do those things, uh, to actually the worst, I think, 
is uh, actually trying to convince another practitioner that Falun Gong has done them harm. I, I think this just became absolutely odious, and, and many practitioners, I think they're quite sincere when they say this, and said this was the worst torture of all. If, if somebody signed a form, said they had renounced Falun Gong, and they went back and became a Falun Gong practitioner again, that was a blot on his office. You know what he told me he was, that they were authorized to do? If they had any doubt, say about Annie, that Annie might go back to being a Falun Gong practitioner? He said, if we had doubts about somebody, we were authorized to kill them. That's, that's the way the government of China operates. There's a speech actually from Jiang Zemin that was circulated uh, to all levels of the Communist Party telling them that this is the leadership team and that they have to cooperate with them regardless of what it says in the law. And that actually violates China's own constitution because um, Article 5 of the Constitution says that no organization is above the law. By September, you have the first reports of a death under captivity. As the autumn deepens, more deaths are recorded. Uh, more serious stuff starts to happen. Uh, and the group, for the first time, is called a cult. It is called a evil cult, and uh, laws are passed to make an evil cults uh, uh, illegal, and to basically create an extra legal situation where the government can do anything it wants to destroy them. By January, Falun Gong starts fighting back. Some practitioners were very quietly uh, trying to hold conferences just like the old days, at great risk, tremendous risk, right? While others were working directly on documenting the persecution, and others, sort of the, if you like, the, the kind of the foot soldiers of the thing were mainly the peasants coming streaming into Beijing. The initial arrests in China uh, did not mean such serious consequences. They might be brought in, they'd be roughed up a little bit. If they wouldn't sign the transformation statement, they were often let go initially. It was the repeat offenders who started to get into real trouble. The conflict shifts from Tiananmen Square itself into the prison system, into the labor camps. This is where the real resistance began. In a prison, no one can hear you scream, and no one can uh, see your pain, and I'm sure that point was made again and again and again uh, in prison. Your sacrifice is utterly useless. Uh, and so it seemed. But in fact, certain people, and you see this in Zhao Ming's case, uh, you see this uh, in quite a few cases actually, put up such a resistance, were so stubborn, so difficult to defeat, uh, that they started to slow down the entire system. Hard criminals will work them over, they know they won't fight back. They're nonviolent, they won't fight back. The shipments of cattle prods start appearing. The system 
starts to have trouble. And you can even see this reflected in the memos that are coming out of the security forces at the time, which are identifying Falun Gong as a really, really difficult problem. You try to visit a prisoner, you try to visit someone in a labor camp, you try to, you know, some people get sentenced to prison, people lose their jobs, money confiscated, torture, all of it, it's all run by the 610 office. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, is uh, a part of uh, uh, the 610 office system, uh, majorly, you know, uh, in propaganda role, as a, as a propaganda machine overseas. When I came to Sydney in 2001, there was a new role in the political issue, that's the Falun Gong issue. So there's a role of uh, persecuting Falun Gong, even here in Sydney. If there's any Falun Gong activities, we will be there monitoring to report back to, to China. And also, according to the policy, any specific uh, instruction from the central government uh, uh, must take any countermeasures, including uh, uh, try all the ways to influence the local government, to limit the Falun Gong activity, to convince the, uh, the uh, local councillors, members of the parliament, uh, and that uh, Falun Gong is uh, abnormal, is evil, that uh, Falun Gong should also be banned in Australia. So that's one of the major roles, actually, I played in the, in the consulate. That's uh, totally against my conscience. I feel guilty when I, at the beginning period, I followed very strictly of the government policy of uh, persecuting Falun Gong people here. You will find there are a lot of Chinese secret agents and the Chinese consulate staff were hiding from somewhere. After three years in prison, I, and uh, when I after I came back, and I was told by some people, you know, they had access to the you know, secret fire, you know, inside the Chinese communist regime, and they told me the information was from Oakland, California, which means you know, there were spies you know, watching us all the time. So you know, whatever we did, they just report to the communist regime. There's full surveillance on it, right? Uh, every time they start to use cell phones, they're, uh, they're, they're rounded up because Motorola has given the GPS coordinates, uh, given, the, given the Chinese police the way to use the GPS coordinates to do that accurately. I was in Australia a couple of weeks ago and I met uh, Jennifer Zhang. You may know Jennifer also went through the same kind of experience that, that you went through, Annie, and, and uh, she was caught by an internet email that was sent by somebody else. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the government of China spends millions and millions of, of uh, dollars a year on this, this uh, gruesome internet censoring system. Cisco set up a system so that you can basically track every communique on the internet. Uh, and use it for arrest. They've actually specifically given it to the 610 office at this point, and they've even, according to our 610 officer now in Australia, they actually have uh, created an actual list of Falun Gong practitioners as sort of a database. Canadian company Nortel has helped the government of China to develop a filtering system whereby uh, uh, Falun Gong practitioners and others can be caught. People feel that if they criticize China, something bad will happen to them. I call that the China magic.
They were very determined that not in terms of the Chinese, but that in terms of British opinion, that they would be known to have tackled the Chinese on human rights. That they just didn't do it. And that everything they said was a lie. That they, in fact, did not bring up these matters, but that they wanted the press, and including me, to think that they had. The China magic is what makes the Chinese impervious to criticism that would be leveled easily at any other country. No one wants to lose the money that comes from China, and that is perfectly understandable, except that uh, you should also consider that you cannot just shut down protests because a lot of money is involved. When the Chinese practice persecution, torture, uh, execution on people with whom they disagree. I think this has to be confronted and just spoken about and written about. I asked uh, the Icelandic authorities about the source of this, um, of this blacklist and uh, the Icelandic authorities took immediate responsibility for it and they said, well, we compiled the blacklist. It was not a prohibition of protesters cannot get into Iceland. It was a very specific prohibition targeting the Falun Gong. To all effect and purposes, it was secret in the sense that uh, it was not intended to come out uh, explicitly. Only 200 practitioners of Falun Gong who actually came into the country, so a ratio of one uh, policeman per practitioner or per potential protester is, I think, a situation that every chief of police in every country would f find desirable. The Icelandic Ministry for, for Justice said we got this information from, uh, for, sorry, from. Uh, um, Germany and the United States, and Interpol was also involved in the process of gathering this information. Uh, they were asked specifically whether the information came from the Chinese government. They said absolutely not. The Chinese government was not involved in any, at any stage. If you were on the blacklist, you were prevented from boarding the plane. There was some embarrassment from Iceland there because they didn't know how to explain the matter to the practitioners. A group of about 70 practitioners who came and who arrived at uh, Reykjavik airport, they arrived into the country. They were uh, questioned about their spiritual beliefs. The Icelandic police uh, determined that they were there as members of the Falun Gong. Something unprecedented for Iceland happened in the sense that these people were uh, at a certain point arrested and uh, they were put in a makeshift detention center. Um, and obviously you have to remember that at this point they haven't done, they haven't done absolutely anything. Iceland is not really easy to, to get out to demonstrate or, or things like that, but I, I think people were widely dissatisfied with what was happening and, and thought that it was not right for a democratic uh, society to, to, to obey to demands like uh, removing people and taking actions on the grounds of, of what the Chinese government wanted to do. I think there were no obvious threat or anything, it was just uh, to please uh, a foreign guest by means that are not accepted in our society.
what upset the Icelanders most was the approach of the Icelandic government was unethical. The problem in this case was that there was the targeting of a very specific group, which is a spiritual group, who were peaceful, who did not create any kind of trouble, uh, and who did not intend to create any kind of trouble from the beginning. The Icelandic government did not know what the Falun Gong was. This is a very important point. There is an ignorance point. There's not, um, I don't think there is any kind of bad faith from the part of the government itself. China is becoming an economical giant. There is pressure on, on governments all over the world not to be unfriendly to, to the Chinese nation. But in this case, I think uh, obeying uh, orders from the Chinese government was going much too far. Some members of the Icelandic uh, diplomatic corps and the Icelandic security um, officials basically to some extent interfered with the freedom of expression, freedom of demonstration of the Icelandic people. You had cases of spying on the Falun Gong activities. You had cases of bogus demonstrators who were put there by um, apparently uh, Chinese officials. You had cases of uh, people and hotel owners in Iceland who were visited by uh, Chinese security officials. They were told, you need to cancel the bookings of these Falun Gong people because these are dangerous people. So uh, it is against your interest. These are people who are uh, mentally unstable and will create problems uh, to your guest house or, or um, hotel. The problem is that these security officials, in addition to do, it, to do this, uh, also said they were coming on behalf of the Icelandic police, and the Icelandic police obviously denied that, um, and it came out very clearly because many of these um, um, documents were released. In terms of the visits that the Chinese president made uh, to other countries, there were problems before and afterwards. Italy, Germany, Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand, Lithuania, for example, where uh, the, ch the chief of the police himself apparently uh, said that he could not guarantee that the Chinese bodyguards of Jiang Jimin would not shoot demonstrators, in that case was Tibetan, uh, from Tibet, uh, on the spot. French Tourism Ministry in a pamphlet advised French businessmen and French hoteliers never to mention the three T words, Tibet, Taiwan and Tiananmen, because they didn't want to offend uh, Chinese people. This is a direct attack on our democratic principles and norms that we've built up over hundreds of years. And, 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 and the view that we have to literally bow down in front of China and accept its anti-democratic um, uh, processes is an extremely worrying one for the future of democratic societies in the West.
Western governments are um, hugely impressed with the recent breathtaking emergence of China as an economic and increasingly as a political and military power. And this has sadly led to many governments, and not just governments, but corporations, uh, censoring what they will say about China because, of course, they have vested interests in the Chinese market. There was even a period where business leaders would come over and would put an obligatory anti-Falun Gong uh, point in their speech. It wouldn't be right out of the Chinese government playbook. It would be more something like, wow, these Falun Gong guys sure sound like a bunch of nuts. For the past 10 years, China has been really, uh, really clever when he's tried to deal with the international media as well as international organizations. They try to involve them, engage them, give them some interest. And in return, they will ask for compliance with the rule of game. There's a dark underbelly of repression um, in China and it is um, the responsibility of the international media to make sure they balance their courage of China so we don't just get some rosy picture of uh, newly enriched people in Beijing and Shanghai posing in front of towering office blocks. We have to know as well that um, the Chinese government is delivering its policies on the back of a lot of repression which is the only way it can keep itself in power. Some apologists for China say, no, 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 if you bring that up, it'll make things worse. There is no evidence for that. What's happened within the journalist community is now, if somebody goes out and, and follows Falun Gong around, what they're usually trying to do is to catch Falun Gong practitioners in a kind of lie. That is, they'll sort of say, are you political? Well, in the mainland practitioner, well, no, no, we're not political. And then they'll find them doing something political, and that's the story. Even if the Falun Gong were an avowedly 100% political organization and it were in some other country and its adherents were being imprisoned uh, and died under questionable circumstances as often as they do in China, uh, foreign governments and others would uh, speak up about this. So I don't think it's, it's even important. The, uh, I, don't, I don't think that the degree to which the Falun Gong is or isn't political uh, is the problem. The problem is that it exists in China. You know, and you can say that's the story well expressing, you know, due sympathy for, you know, of course, the uh, rather unfair persecution that's been leveled on the group and so on. The, the, uh, the problem is that none of this is real reporting, okay, and that we have a, uh, a genocide in slow motion taking place in China, and we have a genuine threat to the CCP that has been building for some time uh, that from a news standpoint has to be taken seriously even from if you were a businessman from a, uh, a risk analysis standpoint you, you, you'd have to look at it uh, but there's the third reason which I think maybe is the most important is that if you report on Falun Gong in a positive way. You will never push a cart in China again. This is what we call the information management. They feel they must crush this. Uh, it is something that threatens the Chinese Communist Party. They lose sleep over this issue. Okay, uh, So it's unusual that journalists aren't covering it for that reason. They have to you know, kowtow with uh, Beijing in a way in order to secure um, a workable relationship, they say, uh, with China in accordance with the Chinese law. What if the Chinese law is put in force is contravening the laws of international human rights. Which side would they be standing on? Another thing suppressing the, the, the journalism uh, is the lack of interest in the human rights organizations. And that one's uh, very complex. And I don't really have a perfect answer for it, actually. We know that the amnesty methodology, which requires independent corroboration for um, abuses is difficult to apply to our findings in a totalitarian society. Many of them. 
most of them. If they have any success at all, they actually have to negotiate with the Chinese government for the few things they can get. A tour, maybe, of a labor camp, uh, perhaps release of a prisoner or two, something like that. Uh, to go into the negotiation and say that you want to talk about Falun Gong ends it. It's the number one group that they're going after. It is the number one, uh, the number one enemy of the state. David Matus and I give Amnesty great credit for putting out an emergency bulletin recently about the arrest of China's uh, most courageous lawyer, Gao Shisheng, who has spoken out on, for the human rights of many Chinese citizens, including Falun Gong practitioners. David and I, in fact, intend to nominate Gao for next year's Nobel Peace Prize. People, especially human rights lawyers, who have been working very hard to fight for justice and fight to defend the rights of the deprived citizens are now themselves in problem. In 2005, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Dr. Manfred Nowak, visited China and Tibet and he reported officially that torture remains widespread in China and Tibet. One of the people they met with was Gao Zhisheng. It was the first evening that they were there before the mission had even officially started and they met with Gao in a restaurant. Um, and on his way there, he was almost run off the road. Um, now, the thing is, though, that I don't know how much of this is on the record or off the record. He went to three different courts in one day or in a span of two days, and every judge just looked at the papers and said, don't you know we don't take Falun Gong cases? The court system in China is so bad that there may be a judge sitting up here at the front of the courtroom but more than half of them are retired military who are, of course, only too glad in most cases to do the bidding of the party. The judges said, um, you lawyers clearly aren't members of the CCP or aren't aware of CCP regulations. Don't you know lawyers aren't allowed to take these kinds of cases? You better be careful, you're gonna get in trouble. Within two days, they put him and his family under 24-hour surveillance. Many people have had a lot of faith in Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao when they first came to power, that they were different from Jiang Zemin. People knew Jiang Zemin was brutal, but they thought Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao uh, cared more about people. Some practitioners said to me, you know, Ethan, you know, new power, new guy coming in, Hu Jintao. Uh, uh, you know, you better hurry your research up. You better be done in the next three or four months because the persecution's going to end now. And that was about two years ago. Yeah. Uh, this is not about one man. It never will be. Uh, this is about a system. Uh, first of all, can I thank Hujia for joining us on the telephone? And I realize he's doing so at some risk to himself. I was in, supposed to meet Gao Zhisheng, but all the ambassadors said, do not meet him. And then I discovered that the people I had already met had been arrested. Uh, I therefore spoke to Gao on the telephone uh, on the 4th of June, on the anniversary of Tiananmen Square. 
and we discussed the Olympics and human rights and the repression of Falun Gong and other religious uh, groups and the possibility of reform in China. And those are the questions I'd like to put to Hu Jia now. Could uh, Hu Jia also make it clear to Gao Xisheng that at the highest levels of the European Union, uh, we are making strenuous efforts to have him released? tell you that um, Mr. Gao's family has been used uh, as, the, as the hostage. Mr. Gao has said multiple times that if without his family, family members being uh, held hostage, if that weren't the case, that he could have done a lot more. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter to him if the Chinese government would uh, jail him or would torture him. He, he doesn't care. While he was still under surveillance, he somehow managed to sneak away from lose the police and go into another round of investigations in northeastern China. Um, and that's the letter where he really writes about some of the most horrific torture you've ever heard. these torture chambers where they, practitioners talk about being stuffed into the trunk of a car, driven for two hours, taken out, taken to some room that's like a dungeon that has three tiger benches and a bunch of electric batons. They get clamped in. And then they just do round after round of torture. Um, and people get tortured to death and they talk about there being a pit there where they bury their bodies. Um, but at the, I mean, and so he was doing that investigation for about 15 days, and he talks about how, though, at the end, he, again, his inspiration for Falun Gong practitioners. Spring of 2006, you started having this evidence coming out of um, organ harvesting from Falun Gong practitioners. And Gao started speaking out about that. He joined this coalition to investigate the persecution of Falun Gong, a coalition of like of basically people who don't practice Falun Gong. Most of them are lawyers or politicians outside of China whose aim is to, is to investigate particularly the organ harvesting. I'll come right to the point. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Uh, uh, following uh, our two-month study, uh, uh, another Canadian, David Matus, who's already been here, and I published our report this summer. Uh, it concluded, and I quote, We have come to the regrettable conclusion that the allegations are true. We believe that there has been and continues today to be large-scale organ seizures from unwilling Falun Gong practitioners. Their vital organs, including hearts, kidneys, livers, and corneas, were virtually simultaneously seized for sale at high prices, sometimes to foreigners." Close quote. I knew a little bit about it already, because there had been the question of 
executed criminals, it has become known that the availability of, shall we say, kidneys, which is one of the commonest, is the commonest transplanted organ, uh, was way higher than you'd expect that it should be um, in terms of the number of the population and the number of people who die and so on. The sons just don't work out. There must be another source of organ donors. The added dimension, of course, is, is the Falun Gong, who, by any interpretation which I am aware of, uh, these people are not criminals. Yeah, we, we found 41,500 transplantations across China which cannot be explained by executed prisoners, that is, uh, executed criminals. Here we're talking about executed Falun Gong practitioners who, as Annie pointed out at the start of her statement, never went near a court. And I can't make that point too strongly that, that there are, I think it's 68 offenses in China for which you can be sentenced to capital punishment. But at least those people go to a so-called court. Annie and the Falun Gong practitioners in China never go near a court, virtually all of them. They're simply taken, as I think you said. You were lucky, uh, I believe, Annie, partly because the, the government of China knew that you had a lot of friends in places like Britain, and that's why you, I don't think, were subject to uh, this terrible risk of becoming an, o an organ donor. When they're incarcerated, uh, they're blood grouped, which is not part of the normal way of looking after prisoners. Uh, you might do their HIV status, there'd be more reason in doing that, uh, but just doing a blood group, there was something about it which again adds weight to the argument. Blood test, blood pressure, chest x-ray, everything they done, even the eyesight. Even they forced me to take all my clothes off to check my body, where has a scar or not. They're abused, they're tortured, but every three months a doctor arrives and gives them a complete uh, medical examination. At the beginning, I thought they care of our body. Later on, I understand, and I heard the news from the internet. They want our organ to take away. Kind of a probing check of their liver and kidneys and so on. Uh, urine test uh, and uh, usually a blood test, extreme blood test. A lot of, about eight vials drawn for tissue matching. And sometimes an eye exam, at least looking at the corneas of the eye, and nothing else. That is the uh, no lymph nodes, no genitals, no mouth, uh, no ears, eyes, no, nothing involving actual seeing because that's about brain function and that's not a retail organ. These examinations, given that these took place in the most extreme conditions of labor camp, uh, were clearly aimed at retail. Quote, organ transplantation has increased in China at a remarkable rate. One institution in China reported 647 liver transplant operations in about a year. The waiting times are between one and two weeks according to the Chinese hospital web pages, close quote. Where else in the world do you get one and two week waiting times? I think in Canada for some organs you wait years to get them. The ability to do the operations more or less to order is very strange. And it just doesn't fit and there must be another explanation. Which is why when I examined the report by Kilgore and Matas, uh, by doing those calculations I was able to say they're onto something. In fact this man from Asia told us, ladies and gentlemen, that the, that the military surgeon, Dr. Tan, Major Tan, who came into his room while he was waiting to get a kidney that would work, with sheets of paper, and he would go down, and there were lists of names on it, and the, the doctor, the, the military doctor, would go down the list, and there would be blood types, I gather, and so on, beside the list, and he'd go down and he'd pick out a name, and he'd go away and he'd come back two or three hours later with a vial containing a kidney. 
And I asked him, well, did you think these people were alive when the, when the doctor was going down the list? And he said, of course they were alive. In other words, these uh, people were, uh, were killed in order to find a suitable kidney for him. Obviously, many evidence um, gathered by Hugo and Matus are indirect evidence. Um, this evidence um, does not come directly uh, from the victims or the eyewitnesses to the atrocities. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, um, the sources of this evidence um, are, uh, are, are different and independent from one another. So the cumulative effect of this evidence gathered from different sources are very forceful. So I just warned the regime, we know what's going on, we're taking names, we're taking down facts. In time, those responsible for genocide will be punished, as they have been in Africa, as they have been in other parts of the world, and one day in China too. So do not sleep easy. I began to think, does this all make sense? Is it credible? Is it plausible? How can we come to terms with it? Because part of this must involve the medical practitioners. Dr. Tom Treasure, who, uh, and I mentioned this in the statement, who wrote an article this month in the, uh, the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. It's called, quote, The Falun Gong, Organ Transplantation, The Holocaust, and Ourself, by which he means the profession. Treasure courageously reminds the profession that in the 1930s, the first step on the road to the Holocaust were taken with the complicity of doctors. But if you're someone, a doctor or a citizen of China watching every second night or third night on the media, some new horror story about what awful people the Falun Gong community is, I suspect that this infects or contaminates the doctors too. And one of the things we learned was that from the a number of sources, but that the doctors consider Falun Gong practitioners to be uh, subhuman. That they're doing a favor to Chinese society in a sect to kill Falun Gong practitioners. They wouldn't be able to keep up the numbers without the prisoners. Western people it's very difficult for them to, uh, to believe it. Because this kind of thing just normally is just out of people's imagination. As, as government, a, a government who can, you know, actually are doing such terrible things. The parallel Olympics, which are the Genocide Olympics of 1936, when already in Nazi Germany uh, there were concentration camps and wholesale repression and genocidal activities against, for example, the Jewish people. I'm really not going to have the full information on this organ harvesting of prisoners of conscience uh, until after the CCP falls. I personally believe that um, even though the uh, tyranny of uh, Germany and its effect on the world through World War II was massive by comparison. The fact is that internally in China today, the situation is actually worse.
what we have seen um, since 2001 when the games were awarded to Beijing is China showing utter contempt for every promise it made to the IOC and the international community before it was awarded the games. Quote, display to the world a new image of China, close quote. That was one of their promises. And secondly, to use the games as an opportunity to foster democracy, improve human rights, and integrate China with the rest of the world. It was an enormous public uh, relations scam, and they got away with the imprisonment of people who were attacking the Chinese record on human rights inside China. Men like Hu Jia, who went to jail for saying, hey, wait a minute, what kind of a country is this which is putting on the Olympics in the way that it is, but at the same time it oppresses its own people? But the fact is, to, to a great degree, with most people, the Chinese got away with it. Virtually nothing to prevent the harvesting of organs from Falun Gong practitioners is currently being done in China, so it's crucial that action be initiated uh, now. The coalition to investigate the persecution of Falun Gong in China now has hundreds of legislators, lawyers, doctors, academics, religious and spiritual leaders in more than 20 countries who are ready to go to China to investigate our report findings. I think, I hope you do too, they should be allowed to go to China. Could you thank uh, Hu Jia for his compassion and his clarity and his courage? And could you, and could you ask him to tell Gao that I have not forgotten my promise of some whiskey when he is free? The next one we'll do, I think, will be in Brussels. And we'll have a press conference, um, maybe in a month or so's time. And uh, either Hu Jia or somebody else. But it's a very good mechanism. Just sorry that no journalists apart from yourselves turned up, but uh, it's, it's not unusual, especially in August in London. <laughs> who spoke earlier, Edward McMillan Scott. Uh, I'm a member of the European Parliament. Uh, and we have here members of the European Parliament and members of the House of Lords. And we are all here with the same message that it's not acceptable for the Olympic Games to go to Beijing next year and carry on as though nothing has happened and that everything is absolutely fine there. One of the things Master Lee said very early on in the persecution was that and actually before the persecution he'd said this as well, is practitioners are going to have to learn to do without me. Uh, that they're going to have to do this for themselves. I can't guide their every step. He disappeared for a while. Uh, some people took that from the Communist Party perspective, they said, "Aha! You see, he's a, he's a, you know, <laughs> this this guy is a, uh, he's not, he's a nobody. He's he's, he's ashamed. He's, he's, you know, he's a, he's a charlatan." Well, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is to say he he was carrying out this action. If I'm the problem, I'll remove myself. But practitioners are going to have to figure this out.
How did they figure it out? That's the focus of that book. What have they done? How have they learned to manage under these circumstances? How have things changed over time? I have to say, uh, I'm quite appalled by the behavior of Westminster City Council, supported by the Metropolitan Police, in switching off the microphones uh, uh, here this afternoon. It's, uh, it's somewhat reminiscent, I hate to say, to the behavior of the People's Republic of China. We don't judge people by what they say. We judge them by what they do. Uh, we don't judge the Chinese Communist Party by what it says. It's a bunch, they're a bunch of liars. We judge them by what they do. Uh, Matt Whitaker is from free to bed. China loves to drape itself in the Olympic flag. It loves the Olympic movement to confer on China respectability. China wants to be a respectable member of the international order. I'm quite interested in how they are able to withstand things that I don't think I could withstand. And there are practitioners who suffered almost every conceivable torture and walked out of prison alive. There's a few of them. Should Olympic Games be run in Burma, in Zimbabwe, or Sudan? And you will all say, of course not. No. If the media won't cover you, you create your own media. You create something which will cover it. The atrocities have culminated into the most despicable crime of all, removing organs. On the radio side, people are learning languages. And of course, on the internet side, they're developing cutting edge technology that nobody's ever seen before. There's this uh, feeling that they can try anything. It's built magazines, art shows, photo competitions, you name it. If you give up now, then everything your comrades have stood for, spilled their blood and sweat for, so no use. Financially, uh, this has required a huge sacrifice by practitioners. Uh, but long term, these things could actually become self-sustaining. As Mahatma Gandhi once said, and I quote, first, they ignore you. There's this cultural aspect. This is going on globally. Second, they laugh at you. I see a, a, a powerful transformation that has taken place. Not on the spiritual side. The spiritual side has stayed remarkably constant. Third, they fight you. Finally, you win. As I see it, you're in the third stage, and the next is victory. Every practitioner feels like they're carrying the body of another dead practitioner. But it meant that people created. It was an extremely creative period. Uh, explosive. In fact, it's, it's, it's one of the most impressive things that a group has ever done, uh, who's been under this kind of, face these kind of conditions. Uh, now it's true, it's in terms of political effect, uh, in terms of um, dollars and cents, making a profit or, 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 uh, or you know, results maybe, it's, it's rather, it's kind of a wash. But in terms of sheer volume of production, very impressive. And actually, uh, it does lead to a perception uh, back in China that something is going on in the West and that they have not been abandoned. Uh, the practitioners in the West, across the world, across the Chinese diaspora, have not abandoned them. There's a place called uh, The Peak, and it overlooks uh, the, the view of Hong Kong. It's a lovely view. And we get uh, three, four, five thousand uh, Chinese tourists there every day. We have many posters there, and we actually have two TVs up there. And we show them another side of the story. Let them make a decision. So we give them another side. When I first got there, about uh, three years ago almost, uh, a lot of the tourists up there, sometimes they would shoot me with a gun with their hands. They would go on the bus and go, sha, 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 they'd shoot me or uh, people would be yelling at us. 
Some people would be crying, some people would be happy, some people would clap, some people would give us a thumbs up. So there was many kinds of people doing many things. And uh, gradually, over the last few years, I've seen a big change. Things are becoming more clear up there. And many people are starting to embrace us. And they really want to know what's going on in China. If Falun Gong face uh, uh, persecutions without uh, enough reasons, we should defend Falun Gong to help Falun Gong to enjoy this kind of basic human rights. This is a general human rights question. And in my opinion, general human rights uh, opinions are not political in that sense. It's, it's about the, the ethical basis of, of being a human. Falun Gong never give up and try its best in all fronts and try to fight its cause. I have friends amongst the Falun Gong uh, and I will do what I can. Now many people who don't practice Falun Gong from all segments of society are helping us out. Why? Because they see that what we're doing is the right thing. We're just trying to save people save people from being killed. I think it's that simple. It's a very, a very hard time for Falun Gong practitioners. I can't see any possibility of uh, uh, finishing this uh, persecution against Falun Gong under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. This resistance, this thing that we see as the sort of Falun Gong resurrection today, started in, in those cells where no one could hear them. Since 1949, terrible things have happened regularly to the population of China at the hands of its own governments.